and uh, I hope I'll uh, meet your expectations after such a great presentation from Daniel uh, just before lunch. Um, but anyways, uh, let's get started then. Uh, my name is Varma Gadarajan. I work in the Fast Track for Azure team at Microsoft. Uh, I specifically focus on the Azure's uh, AI and machine learning services. Uh, our team basically helps uh, customers build their, uh, you know, uh, AI or anything related to machine learning solutions on Azure. Our job is to make sure they do it right uh, so that they stick with uh, Azure going forward. So that's our team. Um, so today, uh, what I'm actually going to do is quickly talk about uh, my learnings from some of the customer projects and my own, you know, personal reading about the space, uh, generating SQL from natural language queries using the uh, LLMs, right? I'm sure, you know, the whole day you've been hearing about LLMs, you know, so has talked about some of the drawbacks, the goodness of it and the badness of it. And uh, Daniel actually talked about a few concepts uh, which are helpful to me uh, because then I don't have to kind of repeat myself a lot and you already have a basic idea of RAG and the complexity with fine tuning and all of that. So again, uh, treat this talk as me kind of, uh, you know, brain dumping what I have in my mind from the reading that I have in this space. Uh, of course, you know, it's, it's still an evolving space, but I'm here to just, you know, share some learnings uh, on how to uh, generate SQL from natural language queries. So, how many of you have uh, been to the AI tours or seen some online demos, you know, where people have shown you stuff like this, where you actually ask question to a chatbot, you know, let's say for example, you know, what are my biggest customers, it goes back and actually comes back with a conversational response, right? You know, so far if you're a data engineer, you write a SQL query, you get a table, um, you know, you build a dashboard with it or do whatever. But now there are actually systems that are enabling you to do conversational chatbots, right? It, it responds in, you know, English, you know, it responds, uh, uh, it makes it easier for you to understand and also summarizes and stuff like that. And of course, there are some advanced chatbots on top of it, where they actually not just summarize it in the form of text, but rather build charts and, you know, uh, graphs and all of that. And of course, there are plenty of use cases in that space as well, right? It makes it easier for business analysts or, or business users to quickly kind of get that information uh, and, and, and make more sense of the data, right? And uh, yeah, I mean, you, you've seen all of these, these are user-friendly user, user, user -friendly, you know, interfaces. Anyone who can write, speak, understand English can actually come in and write a query and, and they do get responses. Now, how good these responses are, what's underneath the, you know, what's the technology or what's the uh, implementation underneath? is what we are actually going to discuss today. Now, uh, both Suhas and uh, Daniel have uh, spoken about a RAG pattern, right? So in a typical RAG pattern that most implementations are today on unstructured data, right? You know, that is data coming from uh, PDF documents, Word documents. Uh, when we talk about enterprises building their chatbots, what they typically do is uh, they actually, maybe let's say you have a file of uh, HR related documents, right, regarding payrolls, leave plans and all of that. Now what these companies want to do is actually use all of those bunch of documents and build a chatbot that lets users, uh, you know, employees ask questions saying, you know, I, uh, uh, what's my maternity leave plan or parental leave plan, uh, what's my long service leave, you know, and, and things like that. When can I take a sick leave, you know, when I'm not supposed to take a sick leave. Uh, so all these questions. Now in those kind of solutions, typically the high level architecture is this, right? Where you have an LLM model and you also have a vector DB, right? Uh, because uh, because when you are actually performing RAG pattern on such unstructured data, what you typically do is you vectorize your data, you know, store that store that vector vectors in a in a, in a, in a vector DB. In this case, an Azure AI search uh, vector DB, and uh, to make sure that you are able to actually fit into the context limit as well as to be able to provide context to the model on your enterprise data, right? You know, as, as, the, as, as you have seen in the previous talks, these GPT models are trained on generic internet data, right? They do not know what the leave policy of uh, Microsoft is, right? You know, leave policy of XYZ company is. So what you actually do in this case is you're actually augmenting the intelligence of the LLM model with some of your enterprise data and letting the model kind of summarize it or be able to ask questions on top of your data. Right, and that's how the typical architecture looks like. Now, if you want to ask the same questions on structured data, right, and obviously, you know, all of us are in businesses, you know, we, we have seen like plenty of 
SQL Server databases, Postgres, data warehouses, data lakes, you know, lake houses, uh, you know, there, there are plenty of things out there. Now, what if you actually want to bring data from those sources, right? Can you simply, you know, add maybe a SQL database as one of the source and ingest that data from those SQL transactional systems into AI search, right? Uh, the answer is yes, you can, uh, but will it make sense for you to actually be able to write queries to ask, you know, uh, you know, something like uh, tell me the total sales that have happened, right? By ingesting the structural transactional data into a uh, vector DBs. Uh, you know, I've, I've seen some customers do it, uh, you know, uh, with some with some okay results, but what I feel is that, you know, it's an, actually an anti-pattern, right? Because the challenges are synchronizing of uh, the transactional data between your actual data source, right? You know, it could be, let's say, you know, Salesforce data, CRM data, whatever, and keeping up to date with your vector DB, right? Because these are transactional data for, for a purpose, right? Which means the rows and the not the, the the rows are actually changing pretty rapidly. You know, there are inserts, updates, deletes happening every every second. Now, how how do you keep your vector DB up to date with such a transactional system, right? And obviously, if you try to do that, yes, there are solutions to do that using change data capture and you know things like that. However, you will end up with a lot of management complexity as well as you are duplicating your data. Right, you're duplicating your uh, transactional data from one system to another system. Next, all of us have seen tables with millions and millions of rows, right? And uh, now you know about uh, context lens and the limits of uh, GPT as to how much uh, data you can really pass in the, in the context. Let's say you have a table with uh, 10 million rows, right? Can you bring those 10 million rows, put it as a uh, context in the entire prompt from the LLM, you know, like you have seen in the previous demos? You cannot, right? You cannot fit that entire data into, into the system itself. So, if you're not able to fit the entire data of a table, can you ask questions that include, that needs to scan on the entire table? You know, total number of rows, total sales, right? You cannot ask such questions, right? Because you're not able to actually bring the whole data. So, those kind of query patterns, especially aggregates and counts and all of that are not really for vector DBs. Like, you know, they are not meant to do that. Vector DBs are actually good for you to actually give you the most relevant, semantically meaningful sentences, you know, the top four or five, you know, ordering them, not, not like aggregating and telling you how many, how many sales have happened, you know, or, uh, you know, uh, or, you know, how many, how many, uh, uh, how many different products exist or things like that. So it becomes difficult. And then of course, the, the main thing in any enterprise GB are, uh, you know, uh, permissions and authorizations, right? You want to make sure and secure who is actually accessing the data, whether the marketing team gets to access HR data, whether, you know, HR teams gets to access sales data. So we do all of these, uh, and obviously, you know, I'm sure all of you have plenty of meetings just on this topic, right? And, and, uh, and we always use the features and functionalities that are built into these RDBM systems, you know, Oracle, SQL, and all of that, they do a good job at it, right? Now, by removing and, you know, putting it in somewhere else, now you have to implement a lot of those things on your own. So that makes it another uh, big challenge. So, if you are not able to use the typical RAP pattern to implement, uh, you know, chat with your own structured data scenarios, what are the options, right? So, that's what, that's what we are actually going to look at today. Now, as I said, we are not able to index our transactional data directly into a vector DB, right? So, what is the other option? The other option that we typically see customers or what's happening in the industry today is, you take a user query, right? Use an LLM to generate a SQL query, right? And then execute that generated SQL query on the actual source of truth, right? Because that's your that's your data, you know, that's the latest uh, data that is available. So you actually have the ground source of truth. Why don't you generate a SQL statement and then execute it on your end source where your actual data lies, and then be able to use it, right? And again, you're, you're still using the goodness of an RTBMS system, you know, making sure all the permissions, everything is in place, you're not duplicating the data, you're not doing anything like that. So that's the that's the approach that we see today uh, that uh, that is happening in the in the, the solutions that are being built out. And uh, as I said, there are two parts to it. One, the first step of the problem is to be able to actually efficiently generate a SQL statement, right? Just by asking the question, can an LLM generate a SQL query? That is actually going to be able to execute on your actual database and then be able to return the right 
results right so that's the first part of the problem then of course once you are able to actually successfully generate uh, you know generate a good sql query be able to execute it then of course you get the result set now how do you present that result set to an other llm to summarize it or to build charts on it and you know do all the other stuff that's a that's the second step of the problem okay now today i'm going to focus more on the first step of the problem you no know? because the second step again it has its own challenges because again once you execute the query if you if you return like a you know million rows uh, you know how are you going to pass those million rows for an llm to summarize and how are you going to uh, use additional tools and other you know charting functionalities and all of that so that's a whole development area but today i'm going to focus mostly on the uh, you know just on the first step of the problem which is converting a user to natural language query to a sql query again what are the benefits of uh, generating i mean being able to uh, you know generate a sql query just by asking questions in plain english what are the advantages would you, would you use it as a data engineer if, if such a tool were given to you Yeah, I mean, a quick, quick one, right? You know, if you're doing ad hoc analysis, right? You know, where you don't want to break your head, you know, writing joins, understanding the table structures, you know, what are the you know foreign keys, relationships, and all that. Especially if you are new to the database, you are a new joiner, you are just getting in. Maybe even you want to write some few quick queries just to explore the data, right? Or even it can be what we are seeing today is uh, enabling those interfaces where uh, customers are actually easily able to generate those queries. So that they can actually you reuse those queries in building their dashboards or some other you know other other systems, and then of course uh, uh, you know review and use generate SQL query. These systems are also enabling customers to kind of quickly explore the data that they have. Okay, and uh, uh, and if you have seen uh, the recent announcement from Azure SQL Database, so Azure SQL Database now has a copilot uh, among the thousand other copilots. Uh, so yeah, so it has a copilot now, and uh, uh, I'll show you a demo of uh, natural language SQL in Azure SQL DB. This is preview today, and uh, I think just a couple of days ago, Snowflake has announced uh, their copilot, and uh, Databricks already has one. Uh, so yeah, I think I think see at, at some point there will be a time, maybe in the next few months, where we will see that every every database system we have a natural language interface for you to explore the data, for you to generate those queries. Now, how are they implemented? To what extent, you know, what functionalities they provide will depend, you know, on several factors. But it's it's, it's coming there. So just to show you a quick demo, I need to figure this out. So just to show you a quick demo. So this is a, a an AdventureWorks LP uh, Azure SQL database that I have. And this is the functionality that I'm talking about, right? So this is the querying functionality that we have today. Um, let's say in this case, uh, I do have uh, a bunch of sample questions with me. So I do have a bunch of sample questions here. So let me pick one of these. Uh, let's say, let's pick this one. Right. And uh, I asked this query to generate. So the implementation that uh, the Azure SQL DB team has taken is not that you ask a query and it actually goes executes by the query uh, you know, automatically and gives you the results, but rather they have taken an approach where it is more of a you know helping hand rather than doing everything sort of a thing. So what they have done is they have actually you know you take a you uh, ask a query in English, uh, it will generate a query. Along with that, it will also provide explanation as to what columns were used, how were they joined, uh, and and things like that. You know trying to provide some reasoning. And you as a data engineer or someone who writes and understands SQL queries are able to review it and then either accept it or decline it. And only when you review it and accept it, that's when it actually goes and gets executed, right? And that's the that's the implementation approach here, right? So this is not the end. I mean, uh, yeah, as you have seen in my first slide, this is not the whole scenario where you kind of summarize, build charts, and all that. This is the first part of it, right? Generating a SQL query. That's the focus of this copilot right now. Uh, so if I accept this, 
you know it, it gets uh, executed and then you know I, I get to see the results and also you have uh, functionalities where you know you can actually uh, select only specific tables of the database and uh, in a way this is helpful as well which we will see uh, in, a, in a few moments as to why but uh, this is this is the uh, NLP SQL functionality that's been recently released in uh, uh, Azure SQL database. And feel free to stop me at any time uh, for any questions. Yes. <laughs> oh, only the questions. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. Yes, yes, you can. Sorry, I believe no, I believe you can. <laughs> yes, that's a good point. So yeah, I, I'll come to that. So what he is asking is, can you understand the structure itself, the schema of the database itself using this scope, right? Can it be a multi-database? Not at the moment, no. Not at the moment, it's not multi-database, it's for a single database. On that particular database, you can select what tables you would like to query against, and then ask it a question, and then it will generate a response. But this gives you like a, a cost analysis when like, um, how fast the Ah, yeah, that's that's an excellent point, right? So I I come to that as well. So again, so as I talk about limitations, I'm I uh, have a slide on limitations myself. <laughs> so, so yeah, that's a very good question. So this question is like, can can the I mean, can it also tell me how fast will that query actually run, right? That's the experience between an experienced uh, you know SQL engineer versus someone uh, like me who does a quick post on Rudiman and try to write some images. I think I have a lot of SQL engineers on the <laughs> session today. We will we'll come to all that. We'll come to all that. Again, uh, yeah, so summarization will let you enable those uh, conversational chatbots, enable plotting, and other advanced insights, and all of that. But again, uh, just focusing on SQL, SQL, we saw a quick demo. Now, there is actually a lot of ongoing research uh, in this particular space, right? And if you go look at it, just like any other machine learning domain where there are like a benchmark data sets and there are companies and, uh, you know, universities and researchers who actually try to build those benchmarks, like similar to what we are seeing happening with GPT-4 and Lama and all the other things. Uh, even for this specific task, NL2 SQL, uh, there are two benchmark data sets that I have uh, come across. Uh, one is the Bird uh, SQL data set, the other one is Spider data set. Where basically they have like a benchmarking samples and researchers then go try different approaches with LLMs, try to beat those benchmarks. And you know, as you can see, there is a you know later work. We'll uh, quickly talk about a couple of those uh, research papers as well uh, that I that I went through. Uh, you know, cut up and share some learnings from there as well. But yeah, it's it's a quite a lot of ongoing research, right? Uh, lots happening in this space. Now, let's start uh, with the approaches. Currently, right? What are some of the easy approaches? Uh, since you have seen few demos on how to invoke an LLM and how to make it do stuff, maybe you can actually come up with a simple prompt so to say that, hey, you are an uh, SQL expert, right? You write a SQL query based on the user question asked. That's it. That's the prompt. Now, if I go and ask any LLM or maybe let's say just, just go to GPT and ask it to tell me what are the total sales. Can it uh, write a query for total sales? It's assuming the basic table structure and it is writing. Yes, I mean, I think, I think you know, if you, if you just use that form alone and say, you know, write a SQL query to find out the total sales from the products table or orders table. Uh, I think it may come up with a SQL query, right? But that's what you call hallucination. Yeah. <laughs> right? Really execute the SQL query. Exactly, right? Because, I mean, it, it did come up with it because on the internet there are a bunch of those similar yeah. queries and you know, it knows how to put a SQL statement together. So it does come up with, you know, it may come up with a query or if it's been like, you know, of, uh, you know, uh, like guardrail in such a way, it may say that, you know, can you give me the information about your database, right? To be able to write the query. But irrespective of it, when you use that simple form and you get a query from it, don't use it, right? <laughs> so that's the thing. Now, next thing what you can actually do is you can improve on your prompt, 
can you ever tell me what you can actually uh, you know change in your form to make it better exactly right so in your prompt similar to what you have seen in the previous demos what you can actually do is again the same statement you are a sql server expert uh, you know who knows how to write the sql queries write a sql query based on the user uh, question here are the table and the column definitions in my database right now what you are actually doing is you are providing the model a lot more context on how your schema is you know how many tables do you have what are the names of those columns what are the data types of those columns etc so with that you actually get pretty decent results you know pretty decent results uh, again there are some comparisons between using gpt 3.5 versus gpt 4 uh, from my uh, exploration what i have seen you know people talk about and the research papers that i was mentioning uh, predominantly they say that gpt 4 actually does much better job uh, compared to 3.5 now in that case what you are actually doing is you have a proper prompt you are giving the schema of the database and then uh, you are asking the question right it's able to come up with the query now can you imagine a scenario where those queries can actually fail now because you only gave the schema of the database the model itself doesn't really know what let's say for example order type column means now there can be a column order type Let's say back error or something like that, and there are only three or four possible values for order type. You know, maybe it's an offline order or online order, right? Or drop shipping order, right? So there are only three types of possible values there, but the model doesn't know that, right? Because you haven't passed that information to it. So now the way you can actually improve on your prompt is by adding a few sample rows from each of the table, right? Or maybe some sample data. that has more information on what possible values the columns can actually contain okay by by improving the prompt in such a way you can actually get even better uh, results and these are quick and easy to implement and uh, again you know that's the, that's an example of a prompt here as you can see uh, you're writing a prompt uh, very clearly calling out what its purpose is and what it is supposed to do you're actually giving uh, a couple of tables as examples But for each table, you are also giving some very three random rows uh, as samples and things like that. Okay. Uh, will it be smart enough in our software links, or do you need to have the two columns as active column or at least related column, and you just want to imply that not to include the inactive item? Do you need to put that in the prompt, or will it not? So you are saying there is a column called is active or is you know is active with a boolean value yes or no? Yeah. Can you? Yeah, I mean, I think you you can include that, right? You know, the, the type of the column would be like boolean, and if you pass some sample rows where there is a variation in the values for that particular column, I think you should be able to. You have to be explicit about it. Yes. Yeah. I mean, see, I mean, the more information you could include that is specific to your database, the better it is, right? Uh, of course, you know, here it's an example from here. There can be scenarios where uh, you have a you know database with some very specific. um you know very very specific column types or very specific stuff and the way you calculate uh, you know like say for example total sales is actually different right the column may be total sales but are you just simply you know uh, multiplying between unit quantity and the uh, sale price or maybe you are doing something else right so the, all those meanings need to be it seems to me uh, something that uh, you can really consider is that if you are looking at transactional database and it is quite deep And if you don't have the corresponding index hints to allow for not blocking, blocking, escalate your page, blocking, escalate your table, blocking. I was, I was, I was a DBA myself, so I was a DBA myself. So I think, I think it's calling out all the problems, you know, that are being solved. So I mean, I mean, quite valid points, right? So basically, I think these values that you know, is if you saying you are know, using this prompt, go start your, uh, you know, general knowledge of your SQL query and start doing some things like that. Right? Yeah. 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 Yeah.
Yeah, no, no, of course. That's it. Those are all real world problems. Right? Yeah, you know, yeah, yeah. I'm sure you know if you use these kind of systems that if you keep generating a completely new query, because this is an LLM, right? I cannot I cannot predict whether the LLM is actually going to generate the same SQL statement every time I ask the exact same question. Right? You know, because you know it might use different aliases the next time that you run it, or it can be doing like that. And if you actually, you know, if you're a DBA, you would hate that. Because if you're actually even change a single letter in a SQL query, it can actually generate a completely different SQL plan, you know, which will use them, you know, which will I'm, I'm sure I think you know some of your you know data engineers and all know that you know the plan hit, plan mishappens and then you have to compute a new plan and there's no cash for that. So all, all, all sorts of nonsense. Yeah, absolutely. Can I share a wish list? So, <laughs> so yeah, this definitely works for a small set of data, right? What, what, what if there is a complex data set you know, where I can attach the definition to with proper, you know, definition of each field? Yeah, I mean, that was a wish list. Yeah, 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 so I, mean, I, I have to wish list, right? Like, yeah. So, as you can see, I mean, challenges, right? Now, we are only talking about all these things where you know, go, you know, bring your schema with some sample rows. Pass it along with your prompt, you know, fit it in the context. But we do have context limits, right? You know, of course, uh, there are models like you know Gemini and stuff which are actually taking up the context limit to like one million tokens and all of that. But uh, you know, not right now, right? You know, today we have context limits. So when you have a real data, whether OLAP or transaction or whatever, and it has like hundred tables and you know, uh, you know, 20 or 50 views and all of the other stuff, how do you fit into schema? Right? You can't. So yeah, that's that's absolutely one of the challenges. And uh, every every call that you make to an LLM is independent. The LLMs are actually not storing. So it's not recording anything. No, it's not recording anything. Oh, okay. Yeah, it's not recording. The LLM make calls that you are making are independent. Like every call that you make. Yeah. So, yeah. So, yeah. Temperature being to zero does give you certain expectation of determin deterministic, like you know, you can generate the same piece of text by setting it zero, but you can't guarantee it. Right? There are a couple of models in GPT with specific versions where there is a new parameter called seed equals seed parameter, right? Just like in your machine learning world, if you set a seed parameter, you can expect like deterministic results. So there is one, but it only works with a couple of GPT models with specific versions of those models, right? But understand this: if you're using the uh, LLM, if you're making a call to it, it doesn't remember anything. It's an independent call. All the chatbots that you're actually seeing today are actually where each and every question you ask, the response it did, and also the text that it actually got from your documents and all of that is being maintained uh, by the developers in the backend, right? That's why you know it's not uh, you know building a chat GPT kind of system involves all these things. In the backend, you will see that message history being deleted. You know the whole query uh, gets deleted. Yeah, in the zone, they had them. The automator would go in, make your orders, and it goes to an AI, and we had uh, thousands of developers in the backend. Yeah, it's 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 yeah, yeah. No, no, no. It's not. It's not that. But I mean, a developer is not sitting there. <laughs> No, 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 it's not a fair example. It's not a doubt sitting in the back and responding to you. It's a, it's a, it's a, it's a, what I'm trying to say is that the, the app is actually structured in a way that the conversation is being tracked and being utilized. So the LLM knows that it just had a conversation before. Ask, you asked a question and you're still in that conversational thread. As an app developer, to build a chatbot like that, you need to handle all these different things. Right, you know, uh, of course, you know, getting access to the API and asking it a couple of questions is easy, but building a chat interface does take time. Of course, there are frameworks to make it easier and you know, make it make make it uh, useful. So yeah, uh, so uh, and, and one more one more optimization of the problem that I forgot to mention, which was along with the take schema and the sample rows, you can also pass examples. Right, that is what is few short zero short is simply making the schema and the sample rows. And in a few short scenario, you can also pass the examples of what the user query is and how things can be. Now, the challenge is, uh, are you going to use the same set of 10 examples for any kind of query that users may ask, right? So that becomes more of static examples. Maybe you want to, what you actually want to do is maybe, you know, 
that's what I'll come to say. Uh, so yeah, any, any questions so far? <laughs> okay, now I know in the first or second slide I said uh, we don't need a vector DB, right? We are not actually using a vector DB, don't you know, we're not going to index all the data from your transactional overall system, etc. But the implementations that uh, we are seeing today are actually utilizing a vector DB, but not exactly for the same purpose as you would do with a with the unstructured data or anything. You're not actually like indexing your whole tables and do all of that. But you're still using, yeah, so you can actually use vector DB to specifically do something like, you know, let's say you are able to somehow, you know, make a junior developer, a SQL developer set and ask him to uh, him or her to actually write 100 sample queries, right? And, uh, you know, uh, they do it. And then what you can actually do is you can actually use those 100 sample examples, put them into a vector DB, right? So that when a user is asking a question, you perform a search on the vector DB, only pick the maybe 10 relevant examples, 10 relevant or you know, 5 relevant SQL examples, and pass those SQL examples as part of your context. You know what I mean? Like rather than using static examples, you're trying to make the examples more dynamic and uh, you know make it relevant to the question that is being asked. So if, let's say you know if the user is asking about product sales, rather than getting the examples that are you know showing you how to query. Uh, marketing tables or HR tables. Now, because you are able to do a vector search onto your vector DB, you are only getting the top five or ten examples that are more relevant to products and quantities and things like that. Right. So that is one optimization you can do. The next thing is uh, the other challenge that I mean, I think we still we will still have, but to some way, the other challenge is that your table names and your column names needs to be very descriptive. Right. If uh, I'm sure all of us have seen these databases when you when you go into something and you you have to actually have to you know get hold of some experienced person to actually understand what the column actually means, like you know because the name itself is not descriptive. Salesforce tables. Yeah, Salesforce tables. <laughs> you can say that. I can't say that. You also have uh, SharePoint tables. <laughs> the same thing. But so yeah, I mean you know it needs to be descriptive, right? At the end of the day, these are language models. Right? They understand language. Right? You know you can't uh, you know have a column name with uh, X Y Z and expect it to understand. Okay, maybe it is for sales or it's a product name or whatever, right? So they need to be descriptive. Now, what I've seen customers do is use vector DB not just for the examples that I was talking about, but also you know index a lot of information about, the, about their databases. You know, basically what they actually do is they do, uh, you know, write summaries like this, like, you know, descriptions of the tables, like what the table means, what it actually does, what columns it has, what is the meaning of each of the column. Now, if the column also has some alias names and things like that, maybe users may come and ask the query in a different way. You know, they don't necessarily have to ask, I mean, name the column as such. So they might ask it in a different way. So creating a corpus of such examples and then vectorizing it and then trying to get that information from the vectors. Now you can actually have scenarios where you know you only select the schema structures of those tables that are relevant to the query so you can actually do those kind of implementations as well. Um, and I've recently come across uh, something called uh, uh, Vanna, or Vanna or, I mean I haven't got around to pronounce it right. Uh, so Vanna.ai uh, basically they are doing the same thing. You know, they are actually enabling uh, a framework for specifically for ML to SQL, where uh, they kind of you know enable you to kind of create a vector DB source on your entire schema, and you also have the ability to kind of uh, add more examples, etc. Which I mean, I have a demo for it. We will we'll see that. Any questions uh, so far? <laughs> Before I jump into a couple of uh, demos. Okay, so uh, yeah, I, mean, I think you should be able to. Yeah, yeah I don't see a reason. So, um, as I was mentioning before, the earlier easy approach sorts that we discussed, right? You know, the schema, the column names, or the example rows and samples and all of that. Uh, so, Langchain actually has a great uh, implementation of it. So if you go into Langchain documentation and look for SQL database agent, uh, it actually you know has all those wrappers for you. You know you don't have to kind of 
uh, you know, gather all those create statements of a table, you know, do select top trees and try to kind of copy paste and do all of that. Uh, SQL database agent actually has a bunch of functionalities that will, uh, that has a database connector as well, which connects to your source database. And whenever you're actually selecting the table as part of your context, it automatically get the, uh, you know, table structure along with some sample rows from that particular table and lets you add that directly into your context. Right, so check check that out. You know, I mean, uh, this is the demo that I have from Lanchain as well. So in here, as you can see, I'm actually connecting to my same AdventureBox LP uh, Azure SQL database that I have. Can you guys see it? Okay, or better? So yeah, connecting to the SQL Server database uh, here, and um, just specifying my Azure OpenAI endpoint details and all of that. And once I do that, um, you know, if I ask a question. That particular module creates SQL query chain, right? A uh, line chain kind of abstracts a lot of those complexities in the back end. So what it is actually doing is now it's actually able to give me, uh, I mean, generate a SQL query. And the approach that they use at this layer is the same approach that we talked earlier. You know, have a prompt, uh, have a system meta prompt, get the schema of the table, get some sample rows, and let the LLM, you know, try to figure out to generate a query. So that's the approach that they use. Now, if you look, if you want to look at the prompt, uh, here is the prompt that Langchain. I mean, I haven't wrote this prompt, right? So this is all coming from Langchain framework. And Langchain frameworks, the SQL database agent also has this prompt specifically curated for multiple databases, like MySQL, SQLite, Oracle, and SQL Server, and all of that. So they do all of that heavy lifting. And uh, as you can see here, so that's the prompt. Uh, and uh, if you look at the prompt clearly, right? You know, they have called out. Because based on the connection string, it was able to understand that this is a Microsoft SQL Server, like Azure SQL Database. And uh, then also it is calling out the specific things that are very much specific to PSQL, right? The language uh, for, for PSQL. And then here is how they're structuring the prompt. You know, use the following format, question here, answer here, and here is table info. Now in the table info, if you want to look at what exactly table info that they are carrying forward, here it is, right? So based on the user question, in this case, they've actually bought in all the tables. So if for each table, they get it in this way and you know provide some sample rows, add off all of this to a prompt, and then finally you can uh, you know generate a query. And this is for a much more complex query. You know, if you look at it, show the total order value for country, it's going to be blah blah blah. Um, yeah. Maybe an update question, but. Can any of this stuff maybe like seed data into a database? Same data. Like seed, like if you're trying to create a test environment, is it can ChatGPT be utilized to actually populate test data? Yeah, I mean, I, I've seen some uh, customers doing uh, synthetic data generation using GPT models and all of that. Like, yeah, I mean, it depends, you know, whether it can be for like some fine tuning examples I've seen. Customers where they write like 100 samples and they like some other GPT models to kind of, you know, simulate, uh, create uh, similar synthetic data and stuff. Yeah. 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 And uh, yeah, as I said, you know, go check out the Langchain uh, documentation. They have a uh, scenario, they have other things like, you know, how to handle large databases and examples like that. Um, so that's the implementation there. How much time do we have? Now, another thing that I talked about was, uh, you know, uh, Banner.ai, right? So recently, uh, the Azure SQL product team also released a couple of uh, uh, example notebooks on how to use Banner.ai with uh, Azure OpenAI. Now, if you look through the documentation, again, as we discussed above, as we discussed earlier, we are using a vector DB, right? It's just that uh, Vanna.ai has a couple of implementation layers and they provide a framework and they make it all easy to use. Uh, but what we need to understand is what is exactly going into the vector DB, right? So uh, if you look at here, I mean, uh, you know, Vanna has a package uh, that you can actually install and you can actually use any LLM or any vector DB is what they say. But in this case, I'm actually using a Banner's own implementation of a vector DB, not, not Azure AI search. 
and because I'm using their implementation, I need to get a key from them, uh, which which is free. And they also let me use a 3.5 uh, GPT 3.5 uh, model as well. Um, just setting up all those here, and then again for the same database, I'm providing the connection string details uh, and all the other stuff to connect to to be able to connect to my SQL database. Now here is an interesting part. So they call it actually training. I mean, I'm mis I'm a bit uh, confused with the terminology that they're using here, but they call it training. But essentially, what that training means is you're actually ingesting data into your vector table, right? So technically, it's not any training. You're not actually training. You're not fine tuning. You're not doing anything. But yeah, I'm confused as to why they chose that uh, language because it's already quite confusing for customers. But so in this case, what they're actually doing is. Uh, they use a query like this, you know, select star from information underscore schema dot columns for Azure SQL uh, databases, right? You know, specifically works for SQL databases. And if you execute that query, for example, on your SQL database, this is what uh, you get. You know, you get a whole whole set of details as to the database name, the schema name, table name, column name, the data type of the column, etc., etc. So they take all this data um, from here, as you can see, they take all the data and then they kind of ingest it into their vector DB. That, that's, that's all it does, right? Yeah, so they're actually doing that. Along with that, what, uh, I mean, if you look at the white paper from Manor.ai, what they say is, along with this information, if you are able to provide any other complementary information, you know, examples, right? Uh, as well as any sort of documentation you may have that explains the database. Exactly the same things that we discussed before, right? You know, what you can actually make to do better when you are inserting data into your vector DB to make it relevant for the queries. They do exactly the same thing, but in a more structured way, and they provide the framework for you to be able to do that. So they take different type of inputs. They either, you know, they take this information, uh, you can actually uh, insert DDL queries as well, you can insert documentation. Or you can insert SQL examples, right? So you can actually you you insert all these into a vector DB, and finally they utilize this vector DB information to to generate a SQL query whenever you are asking a question. You know what I mean? But the main the main thing that you need to keep in mind is if you are trying to implement the same thing in your systems, yes, this uh, information underscore columns can be easily you know you can fetch that easily by running a query. You know, insert into a vector DB. That's fine. But curating those examples, right? Curating those examples, curating the data, uh, like uh, documentation or something, is the is the difficult task. Is that include keys? Well, foreign keys. Yeah, I think so. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. So yeah. Uh, so as you can see here, you know, you can insert uh, SQL. Actually, no, it should be like vn.insert or something, but they call it vn.train, uh, which is again confusing. But yeah, documentation, uh, SQL, you can also insert some additional DDL statements, and you can actually keep inserting such information to make the, you know, and, and here is how their vector DB structure is, you know, uh, you know, all the all the tables and columns and you know information that is actually inserted in the form of text. So I think they do actually some pre-post-processing where once you get the columns and schemas and all of that, they make it more descriptive uh, as to the table name, column names, and data types, etc., and then insert into a vector table and use that. Uh, just, is it possible to have some sort of like get it to do a coach task? Like, like you've got a large database with data collected from years and years and after about 10 years or something, it's like the data becomes irrelevant and no longer needed. Could you use natural language to try and set up some kind of purge procedure? Yeah, so well, I think, I mean, purge, delete, or you know, yeah. whatever you mean, right? Yeah. So that's actually on my last slide on oh. the wish list uh, to say that uh, try and restrict your NL to SQL generations to select statements. Right, like you know, I mean, you you do not want to cause any things where you actually do insert updates and deletes, but rather purely for select statement. But of course, you know, if if you are in an if you are building an interface where the one that I showed earlier, the Azure SQL Copilot, where you generate a query, but someone needs to manually approve it and then execute it, maybe in those cases it's fine. It's not that elements can't generate a statement. 
it says that we suggest you know customers to be more careful about being generating like any sort of statement you know DDLs and all those sort of things and, and stick to SQL uh, so select statement. But yeah, I mean, if you have an interface where before executing your query query, if you have like checks and things in place, audits and other stuff like that, absolutely. So yeah, uh, as I said, you know, Vanna.ai provides this, uh, you know, small vector DB where you can add, uh, you know, as much information as possible about your database and let it, uh, you know, generate the SQL queries. And just like with any other system, you know, you need to experiment with uh, the model that you're using, either GPT 3.5 or GPT 4. And again, these models come with their own parameters, you know, temperature and other parameters as well. So you need to uh, change with play with those as well. And of course, the prompt itself, but you know, how, how much you can actually improve on your meta prompt, uh, give it, uh, you know, as much information as possible on the SQL dialect and those things. Any questions? Uh, this? Okay, so and uh, as I said, uh, wanted to quickly talk about a couple of research uh, implementations, right? So the first one that you see here, uh, multi-agent uh, collaborative framework for text to SQL. Uh, so that is actually on the uh, you know the top version on the leaderboard for Bird uh, benchmarking. Now, as you can see here, the approach that they take is not just a single LLM call or anything like that. They actually use multi agents, which means you have a uh, you know selector agent that actually picks and chooses what things to use. And also, uh, if you read their paper, right? So they mention things like even for each table, let's say there are like twenty columns in a table, right? Do you really need twenty columns to answer that query, right? Or can you just only select the information about five or ten columns uh, out of the table? So they have that selector agent. Again, it's an LLM call by itself. Uh, once the LLM actually selects the tables and the you know, columns and all of that, then you pass that on to uh, the decomposer agent, where the decomposer will actually break down the question that was asked into multiple subqueries, and then it actually generates a SQL query for each of the subquery. And then finally, you also have a refiner agent that actually uh, validates the syntax of the SQL query make sure everything is in place and whether you are able to execute that on the database itself or not. Because a lot of times, you know, uh, the SQL queries do look fine, right? However, it can be a single apostrophe or, you know, uh, uh, the keywords not being used right or missing brackets and things like that, the query would eventually fail, right? So checking those things as well. So that's the uh, thing. And uh, in their paper also, they specifically called out GPT-4 as uh, you know, uh, giving better results uh, in their testing and in their benchmarking as well. So that's a, a multi-agent collaborative framework paper. Uh, that's the implementation that they have done. Uh, they do not use a writing, uh, vector DB, right? So they're not, I mean, again, these are benchmarks, right? Again, uh, because these are research papers, they have tested it on maybe a, a database that has like decent amount of schema. But when it comes to real world, that's a different scenario, and that's what RAG and other things will help. Uh, sorry, RAG, RAG is the vector in this field. Now, this is another paper in SQL. Uh, we actually have done a small implementation of this as well. Uh, they actually do a different approach. Again, multiple LLM calls happening at each layer. Uh, they do schema linking to figure out uh, what the column names and what values in a where clause or things like that that are needed to be done. And they also classify the query to classify it into three categories, whether that query generation will need nested complex or non-nested complex. You know, nested complex is where you have like uh, sub-queries and, you know, inner joins and blah, 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 and all of that, uh, whereas it, whether it is an easy query. And depending on the classification that was done by the LLM, then they route it to another uh, module for generation depending on what sort of query it is. Whether it is an easy query, they have a different prompt for easy query, they have a different prompt for nested uh, complex, non-nested complex. And also along with the prompt, they have a bunch of examples. And based on the classification, they actually pass the relevant examples, right? Uh, if it is an easy query, they simply pass by some queries with their clauses, order bys, and stuff like that. If it's a nested query, uh, uh, complex query, then they pass more samples with inner joins or the joins, etc., etc. So that's the uh, two different implementations. And finally, 
uh, I think uh, you know the previous two talks have actually made it easier to convince you that uh, you know why fine tuning can be complex and uh, costly. <laughs> so, but there are there are uh, if you go to hacking phase and look around, there are actually a couple of uh, fine tuned models uh, specifically for this purpose. You know, NL to SQL. Uh, they, you know, I provided links to a couple of them. Lama, you know, two seven uh, two Lama two seven B A model that's been specifically fine tuned for uh, NL to SQL tasks. Uh, I think you know now what the challenges of uh, ch challenges, but yeah, it comes with an expense because you need to curate, uh, you need to uh, you know acquire the data set that you need that you can use to actually fine tune. Uh, and also one other important thing is, let's say you fine tune LLM Lama to model, right? You went through all that thing, you convinced your manager to spend some five thousand dollars budget, um, and you have actually fine tuned a model Lama to model, right? The very next day, Lama three releases. Right. <laughs> so now you have to you have to you know fine tune all of fine, fine tune again maybe because again your manager might say that I think Lama three has better benchmarks why don't we go and fine tune that right now again you need to do the same thing with that uh, or maybe at some point you know maybe Lama doesn't do as much better Gemini or Anthropic models actually does better so maybe you actually keep switching you know your fine tuning approach to these different LLMs coming from different companies or rather you know try and get as much better results as possible with uh, rat patterns and uh, other implementations, right? So those are few challenges. Finally, uh, which are the implementation that you do, right? I mean, I think this is one topic that we don't see uh, people talking enough. You know, all these chatbots that are, you know, getting you the results with charts and summarizations and all of that are great. Uh, as I said, if you go to semantic kernel or if you go to uh, Langchain, uh, you, like I said, there are agents that are readily available for you to quickly print some samples on small databases, right? Uh, however, uh, evaluation metrics, right? You need to be able to evaluate that the approach that you're actually taking is good enough, right? And, uh, and, and how do you do that? So again, going through the research papers, the bird and uh, spider benchmarks, I found, uh, we found like, you know, four different metrics. Uh, those two papers are actually using, you know, one is the component. So again, how do you evaluate a SQL query? Like, you know, how do you compare? You know, whether it is a, if it, if it were a simple, uh, not simple, but unstructured data example, for example, you can actually say, okay, this answer is very much similar to this answer, and you get a metric out of it, and if it's doing better, it's a good. But how do you compare SQL statements, right? So, again, what is good and what is bad is a different story, but these are the four different evaluation metrics. One is component matching. Looking at the you know ground truth SQL that your developer actually writes and versus what was generated for the same query, you look at you know what sort of keywords were actually used, right? The process uh, or, or the keywords like select, where, go by, inner join, outer join, and things like that, and try and see whether they're in the same order or whether they're you know they exactly match. That's one. Next one is simply try to match the queries as is, and that fails most of the time because you know LLM might generate. Uh, SQL queries with square brackets around the columns, or it might actually use a different alias, right? Because aliases are pretty used. Um, you know, you can say, uh, you know, same entry dot product as p, or someone else might say p p. You know, <laughs> so the, the, so exact exact matching, you know, doesn't always work, but that's one of the metrics that they're looking at. And then the execution accuracy. So this is the metric that uh, I have noticed that Warner.ai is also using to, to create their benchmarks. In essentially, ex execution accuracy is like I take the random generated SQL query, I take my query from my SQL developer, run it against the database, and if both the data sets are exactly the same, the outputs are exactly the same, you know, it's, it's a good query. So execution accuracy, right? Um, and then uh, valid efficiency score. Uh, this metric was actually mentioned in the bird uh, bird benchmarking, where apart from the execution accuracy, where the result sets being the same, you also need to make sure that you are able to execute the query in as much less time as possible. Right. So there is a performance, uh, you know, performance metric that is being tied up, and that is the valid efficiency score. So as I said, you know. Uh, these are some of the uh, evaluation metrics that you can potentially use on uh, how to do this. Any questions? How much time? One minute. <laughs> okay, the wish list. Uh, so considerations. Again, as I said, uh, you know, all these techniques are very much suitable for uh, descriptive databases, but again, using a vector DB 
with some uh, documentation and information about your tables and schemas, you can get better, uh, better results. Another thing, you need to be very clear and concise in your asking questions. You know, you as a developer, let's say you build a chatbot, but you also need to make sure you educate your users as to how to ask questions to it to make it valid. You know, you can't uh, ask the bot and you know let them write whatever queries they want in whatever vague manner to get results out of it. I think you know this is very important in the Gen AI world that you educate your users as to how to take value from it, right? You know, rather than them trying to be smart with it or trying to kind of uh, test it, thickness, uh, anything and everything. I think that's very important. You know, include keywords. You know, try to have that understanding that you know LLM will be able to do a better job if you provide the column name, right? You know. Specify order by you know descending or ascending and things like that. And then most important thing, like we discussed before, prompt engineer ignores data modification or GDL generations, uh, very much important. Uh, roles and authorization controls. Again, if you look at the uh, Azure SQL Copilot, you have a place where you review the query, you accept it or decline. All of that is actually designed. If I am actually going in as a user, I'm only able to select the tables that I have permissions to, right? And, and when I click on accept query, again, we'll do an authorization validation whether I have like real permissions on those tables or not. So that is very important, right? Because some of our databases do include different business units in the same database, right? So you need to make sure that these capabilities, uh, you know, these uh, restrictions are in place. And finally, there are possibilities for SQL injection attacks, uh, you know, and other, you know, inadvertent data leaks and all of that. So when you're implementing these systems, make sure that you have uh, those in place. So now this whole set of control is not there. No, because see, uh, in this case, we are actually executing the query on the underlying database itself, yeah. right? So when you when you go to execute, obviously you need to build your connection string, you need to execute it, right? So in that case, you validate whether the user that is executing the query has relevant permissions or not. So means it's there. So it is tied to your database. Database and your user, user name. Yes, 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 absolutely. Yes. Sorry, this is specific to Yes. No, I mean, even from a chatbot's uh, standpoint, right, if you take it to the next step and try to build a chatbot, a user is logging into the chatbot. You still need to use those user credentials and uh, validate, you know, whether they're able to generate a chart on marketing data, right? If they're HR person, you know, to uh, anything and everything that you do from an enterprise standpoint. You still need to keep those considerations in place. And finally, uh, to your points, yes, the thing that I have not seen so far is um, none of these uh, NM2 SQL implementations actually using stored procedures in your databases. Right? You know, we all write stored procedures for a reason, right? Parameterize them. Because it helps in a lot of ways, not just from a program programmability and the administration standpoint, but also stored process does have performance you know, benefits in cases, right? You know, you use parameter. There is a plan that can be used, reused, etc., etc. But none of these implementations I have seen are using stored procedures or anything like that. That's why I say, you know, your DBS might create you. Uh, if you create ad hoc queries, uh, thousands yeah. of ad hoc queries in there. Oh. Oh. Is it because we are we are time? Okay. Yeah. We will just take one question. It it is for Verma, and Verma will be here, so we can ask him any other questions. Um, so I mean, I think you see if, if you're able to kind of get the information from the database, right? To I mean, like I said, the schemas and columns, you can experiment with it. I'm not sure. Because if you're okay, because what you're asking for is like a description of your database, right? And elements are good at you know, LLMs are good at generating text. As long as you pass the relevant information, I'm sure you can get a two-page word doc. Uh, you know, I, mean, I can I mean, I depend on what meaning it comes back, but it will generate a two-page word doc. Uh, so, what's the best place to upscale in this topic? Uh, like I said, uh, uh, you know, I'll share the slides. So, take a look at those benchmark data sets, as well as take a look at uh, Vana.ai, the implementation that recently came across. It's an open source project as well. And most importantly, line chain uh, uh, security decision. All right, guys. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank um, you very much. Uh,